If you were guessing that this is a two o'clock block, you'd be right here on Life in the Law. We're going to talk about legal things today, but let me just make a statement first, and that is this is about leadership. And leadership, you know, in this administration, it has revealed itself. Leadership is more important than it ever was in a multifaceted, multi complex, highly specialized society where people can get divided so easily. Leadership is critically important. And we have to build leaders, not only for state government and state process and state industry, we have to build leaders for the whole country, in fact, for the world. And that's what Pat Mao is doing these days. She's building leaders. You know? You know why? Because it's the Bar Association, HSBA, Hawaii State Bar Association. She's the executive director. Welcome to the show, Pat. Thanks, Jay. Thanks for building leaders. And not Kisha only King. leaders, ethical leaders. Okay. Mm. Good. That's yeah. very important. It is. Yeah. It is. And Keisha King, my co-host, and we're going to explore with Pat how this is done that's here right. in Hawaii Nei with the Bar Association. In a program that's, what, 10 years old now, Pat? We're going into our 11th year. 11th year. 11th year. So this program has been in effect and running before I joined the Bar Association. And it's a, it was a product of a group of engaged HSBA members, Bar members, and they were in a strategic planning group. And this was one of the things that they said they wanted to establish a leadership institute for aspiring young attorneys who have demonstrated some sort of interest in leadership in the bar or and or in the community and who show great promise for in the bar and the greater community. Why is the bar interested in such a thing? Well, as bar members, we take an oath of office and we not only say we're going to practice the law ethically, but we also have community service aspirations to I think it's unwritten rule, and Chief Justice Rechtenwall has always promoted this. While we don't have a mandatory pro bono, mandatory um, volunteerism, we promote it from within because we feel we have skills that we can lend itself to, to our basic lives, not only the practice of law. So a lot of times our attorneys are called upon to do a lot of things in the community. And so we're trying to cultivate leaders people who will do it the right way, people who are not worried about thinking out of the box, and definitely people who are forming the core of the HSBA, and they have the core values of the profession at heart. So this is how we promote the longevity of our profession. I, what I heard you say, and I'd like to explore it for a minute anyway, in terms of one of the fundamentals of this program, is uh, leadership includes community service. It, it includes volunteer community service. Is that what you're saying? Yes, it does. After the fellows complete their year as fellows, they submit a program or project um, uh, outline to me. And for the following year, they go out into the community or within the bar, and they do something that's not related to their day-to-day -day -day job. And it expands. And I tell them to do something they're passionate with, something that they're not used to doing when they're sitting at their desk. And we did something with Think Tank a couple of years ago, which really expanded the outside borders of their thinking with the three-digit project that you headed. Well, this is the triple-digit program. That's right. Yeah. Let me take a moment to explain that. Everybody gets a bar number. And uh, back in the day, um, the bar numbers were less than 1,000. And, and if you had a bar number that was less than 1,000, it would be triple-digit. And we had this program where we try to talk to all these old guys who, and girls, um, you know, who uh, had, had numbers of less than a thousand. And it was really interesting. We made a movie of that. We played it at your, your annual uh, bar, bar program. Yeah. 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 So um, I guess you're wondering, Keisha, you know, how this program, you know, sort of got started. Because, you know, this is a program that's complex. You have to keep on interesting people. Mm -hmm. um, and they may not be completely interested. Lawyers are driven. They're, lawyers are always driven, mm -hmm. uh, either to make money or to advance their careers. Uh, there's not all that much volunteerism, and you have to encourage it. And the Bar Association has a role in all that. So I guess the question, I'm only suggesting a question here, is how did you formulate all the parts of this program? How did it come to you, Pat? <laughs> 
She's going to ask you this in a minute. Yeah, what he said. How did you formulate this program? Actually, the, the template was in place when I joined the Bar Association about eight years ago because my mm -hmm. predecessor had started it. So what it is is the template is we have a core coordinating group headed by Judge Ricky Mayamano, who's been honchoing it since the very start. She was at the very beginning. At the yeah. very beginning. Yeah. At, she was the moderator at the Strategic Planning Committee. And she calls the group together. We have a group of people who have regularly participate, lawyers, who want to do programs and um, get the panels, and they volunteer for this. We get together in January. We plan the year's programs out. Everybody gets their assignment, and we promote the program, and then we accept applications, and this group helps us pare down the 30 to 40 applications we get to about 15 people who will join the Leadership Institute in May. And the programs are monthly, May through December. And they spend an half, an, half a day with us at the Bar Association. Or when Mayor Caldwell has We the People, he takes them on walking excursions. Oh, cool. Um, so there's, there's always a surprise with Mayor Caldwell because with him, we always tell people, you're not going to know two or three days before, but make sure you wear walking shoes and you wear comfortable clothes. Because he's taken us down to Chinatown to visit the homeless shelter. He's taken us to the police department when they had the controversy over some of the police officers getting on tape, getting into trouble. And he's talk, he's, we've gone to Kaka'ako to talk to the Howard Hughes people and Earth Justice. And he had a whole panel. So that's outside. We go outside into the community. And same like when we have the pro bono month, that's October. We take the fellows to different legal service providers around town. Um, so access to justice room in the district court, legal aid, volunteer legal services, ACLU, and they'll visit all these places and they'll actually meet the staffs and ask them, what do you do? Is there a place for me to do my project? So there is a different theme for each month is what you're saying. Exactly. Different program. Exactly. Okay, that's terrific for each person, but it kind of baffles me. You would think that um, they would get this type of training while they're in school. Why must they continue this after? <laughs> when you go to law school, mm -hmm. they don't teach you how to be business people. Mm. They don't teach you how to be leaders. They mm. don't teach you, you know, the rules of the profession, like the rules of civility, the rules of pro bono work. It's, in law school, it's very esoteric. It's very driven towards textbooks and driven towards passing the bar exam. Oh, wow. So these are things that you don't learn in law school. And mm -hmm. like I said, being a business person, they don't really teach you how to be a business person. So some of our attorneys, we have continuing legal education. Accounting 101, how do, we re how do you read an asset? And what's do an need asset? to know that. They, they need yes. to know that because they're managing people's money. They're managing a business, and some people don't come equipped with that. So they don't teach you everything in law school. That's, no, that's true. Yeah. Especially with, there are so many books now with regard to law, but leadership especially. I have been thinking about Stephen Covey and so many others like him. How is it that they're not able to study that? Um, and do you all study any of those great leadership authors? See, we leave the programming to the people who are coordinating the program seminars. So a lot of it, when we do have, like, say, for example, former Attorney General David Louis, who's now a partner in a um, law firm, he has done extensive research on leadership. Um, so he brings out and all these esoteric things and philosophies. But we want to bring to the fellows the real aspects of it. What does it take to be a leader? How do these people develop their style? What drives them? What keeps them in to the, 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 the path they're on? Mm -hmm. So it's more talking about personal development from an attorney's perspective. And all our t speakers are attorneys because we have a kinship. We all stress getting into law school. We all stress getting through law school. We all stress taking the bar exam. We all had these milestones that other professions may not totally understand what we've gone through. So all of it is local attorneys and pretty much they're in all different aspects, all mm -hmm. different walks of life. You know. There are secondary aspects to this too. 
you know, one of the big bar association values is civility. Because when you're practicing law, you want to win mm-hmm. for your client. And, and the natural, the organic kind of natural expression of that is you fight. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And some lawyers don't learn about civility. Wow. You know, if you're going to fight, you still have to be civil. And um, so, so the, the bar wants people to be civil. The, the judges want people to be civil. And when you're in a program like this, you, you learn how to rub elbows. You learn how to appreciate your fellows, uh, your fellow lawyers in the practice. I think it's an important lesson. Never spoken, but it's an important lesson. It is. Because I think here in Hawaii, we're unique because we're so small. Mm-hmm. And even though we're separated by islands, the coconut wireless in the legal profession is strong. So we mm-hmm. always tell the young leaders, I mean, when I have the, I, I'm in charge of the professionalism course from the Supreme Court, we always tell people, be careful what you do. The person you cross today or the person asks you for an extension and for no good reason, you just don't want to do it, you don't want to play ball, it's going to get back to you. So this is part of the bar's mission with the Leadership Institute, sections, committees, other projects, face-to-face, because if I know you by face, mm-hmm. I'm more likely to listen to you more carefully and not just brush you off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you call me for an extension of time for something, I'll yeah. give it to you. Mm-hmm. But if you deny me an extension of time, just because you're being spiteful, mm-hmm. I'll, not, I'll never give you an extension of time. Right. And so you have a, a degradation of the relationship that way. And he'll you know. probably tell five other attorneys, so-and-so <laughs> didn't give me extension of time for no good reason other than he didn't like the way I look. So if he asks you for something, double think it. it mm. That's how it works. <laughs> mm. But your program doesn't end that entirely. It just teaches them the alternative that you don't have to be that way. Yeah, because we're in the warrior mode, mm-hmm. men and women. But then our program is good because we take people from all practices of law. Prosecuting attorneys, public defenders, small firms. I have an insurance claims adjuster. Last year I had a probations officer from the federal court. We have people from the neighbor islands because the neighbor islanders feel that they're isolated. They want to know people what's happening in Honolulu and we want to tell them HSB doesn't stand for Honolulu State Bar Association. So it's different perspectives, civil practitioners, criminal, family. So they all come together and we talk about leadership. But, you know, the first segment we had was with Marjorie Bronster. And when she was speaking about her experience as the attorney general during the broken trust and during the time she was going to court, nobody moved. There were, you, you could, the, the bodies were just mesmerized. And one of the things, if I may say, she said the day she had to walk from her office to the Supreme Court to argue um, the, one of the Bishop Estate motions, there was a whole line of people in red shirts, and they were bussed in, and they had the shirts down with Bronster, um, stay away from commandment school. And she, she said, you Even know, she, small children. She was walking <laughs> through the group, and she said, well, she was there with her staff, and they said, okay, brave face. We're going to walk across the street. But she goes, it seemed like I was going to walk a mile. But as she was walking, people under their breath would go, you go, girl. You Mm -hmm. like what you're doing. And she said she never expected that. So it's those type of stories from Mm -hmm. their perspectives as leaders that it brings to the the fellows something that they've never seen that they'll never hear. You wouldn't hear about it. You wouldn't read about it. But when she said People in that group were muttering under her breath, mm. their breath to her, showing her support. That really shook her more than facing the big crowd after that. Yeah. yeah. And in this group, you know, in these sessions, they let their hair down. Mm. It's really, I mean, and, and I think we encourage them to do that. We want to know how they feel, their experience, so that the um, you know, the panelists, uh, the, the, the elder lawyers, senior lawyers who are talking to the junior lawyers. We want the junior lawyers to appreciate how it was for Marjorie Bronster. Uh, we want them to hear those stories and learn things they would not otherwise learn. But right now, we can take a short break. Okay. Okay? 
Hi. We'll be right back in one minute. That's uh, Patty, Pat, Pat Mao. We go back a we long way. We go back way. a long way. We go back a long way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Keisha King. And we're talking That's about right. the Leadership Institute at the Bar Association. We'll That's be right. right back. Aloha. I'm Lauren Pear, a host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you'd go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks so much. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Jane Sugimura, host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thank you so much. I told you we would return, and we have returned. I'm Pat Mao and uh, Keisha King talking about the Bar Association's leadership program. You had something you wanted to ask, Keisha. I did. You know, this program sounds really amazing. I would love to know how the junior attorneys are changed after this. The fellows come in very tentatively. And the first two sessions, they're really quiet. And then... We give them a lot of breaks so they can get to know each other, so they can talk to each other, get to know each other, and they're more willing to share personal experiences, what they want to accomplish, what in their background leads them and makes them tick. And so they come in tentative. And then as they get more and more, and we, we prep them and we say, you know, we can advance. These are the people who are going to speak. Please Google them. These are their bios. They come in and they start getting more confidence. And by the end of the session, it's like free flow. You can't quiet them down. Mm -hmm. And at the end, when we do the wrap-up, um, Judge Amano does the wrap-up, and they talk about how it changed them, how it changed their perspective. And some of them have revealed that it changes their personal life, too. Hmm. That's really uh, good. That's interesting. Yeah, because we well, we've got a, a lot of people who came in before there were somebody, and the alumni... It, it, it reads. I mean, I, I'm really proud that these people were Leadership Institute fellows before they've assumed their positions now. We have Judge Jill Otaki, federal judge, mm -hmm. Judge Darian Ching Nagata, state district court judge. We have people who are corporate officers. We have people who are now named partners in their law firms. So we have a broad spectrum. And just so happened we're going to have the HSBA board elections. Mm -hmm. The two people running for vice president, which is a succession to become HSB vice president, both of them were leadership institute fellows. Mm. And we have about yes. two or three fellows who are on the HSB board, a couple of people who run the sections, mm -hmm. and they're all over the place. It's like a secret society. So one of my fellows said, we should develop a secret handshake. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> well, there is something like, I mean, because you know, they, they know each other, they stay together, they're like graduates of a, a given school that, that were tight while they were in school, uh, and they know each other going forward. And uh, this is a valuable thing to have. But there's something else too, though. It seems to me that, um, you know, being able to talk to a judge is not something that comes easy. If you don't know the judge, you know, sometimes you know him, maybe, maybe he's your cousin's uncle's neighbor or something, <laughs> but, but mostly he's not, you don't know him. Mm -hmm. And you appear in, in, in court in front of him, and your relationship is, is across the bench. It's not a matter of being friendly. It's, mm -hmm. it's not a matter of knowing him personally. Mm -hmm. um, now, he comes in and he talks to you, and he tells you his personal thoughts, and you can ask him personal questions, and he can... So this is really valuable. The same thing, you know, m most lawyers who practice, you know, they start as associates and firms. They're at the bottom of the heap. They work on the cases they're assigned. They're in a little silo. Uh, they go out and drink with other associates maybe, but they don't have a lot of exposure to the partners. Mm -hmm. They don't have a lot of exposure to the families of the partners. They don't know uh, what the partner's career has been like. Mm -hmm. And now here's a partner at a big firm, a guy who's been a bastion of the Bar Association, who's telling him his personal story. This is extraordinary. 
you know, and it's only too bad you can't accept everybody, Pat. The coordinating committee likes it small, so it gives everybody a chance to ask questions. And speaking about interaction with judges, one of the most popular programs is in September, and Judge Omano coordinates that. That's speed dating with the judges. <laughs> That's the day first we go to federal court, mm -hmm. and then the, we talk with the judges in federal court, and we look at their quarters, we look at their chamber, and we have lunch at the cafeteria. Then we walk over to the state court, and in the Supreme Court, the, the first floor, they set up like 15, 16 desks and mm -hmm. chairs, and the fellows spend five to eight minutes with each judge. So we have Chief Justice Rechtenwald, every year he asked to be on that panel. Every year, Sabrina McKenna asked to be on that panel. Every year we have certain judges, and Judge Amano said she has a wait list, because if she doesn't call somebody that year, like, how come? Did I get bad reviews? So <laughs> we have judges who want to. So from the state court level, from the Supreme Court, all the way down you know to why? district because court. They don't get a yeah. chance to speak to these people yeah, either. Yeah, on a one-on-one. -on -one. Because yeah. if so, you're a transactional lawyer, you don't go to court. You don't even know what these people look like. Right. Wow. And to be able to meet the chief justice or even, you know, a district court judge, and they, they're asking you, what makes you tick? What do, and it's, it's, it's mind-boggling to them. And mm -hmm. they, they go, whoa, you know, I saw so-and-so. I saw a judge so-and-so on the street, and he remembered me. And I went, yeah. There's a real benefit in that. Might even be yeah. a benefit that reveals itself in, in the in the ruling. Who knows? You don't wow. know. But you know, I wonder about it. I wonder about this. And I haven't seen uh -huh. the, the program operate in this way. But suppose there's a Supreme Court justice, and there's the Leadership Institute people, and um, and the question is, and it's an old and cold case. It's not a case that's you know subject to decision right now. It's uh, it's, it's finished. Final of appeal. And the young lawyer says to the judge, you know, you know, you ruled against the, the super ferry a few years ago. That was really bad public policy. I disagree with that case. Can you justify that for me now? What would happen? I never came across the question framed like that, but I have heard some of the fellows ask the judge, not in direct terms of a specific case, but they give a factual situation and what was the rationale for that? And then if the judge can't speak to it, they will. Hmm. That's very interesting. I think that's the insight that a junior attorney would definitely benefit from. Yeah. And those questions, they are unlimited. They can talk to them about anything. Except pending cases or anything mm -hmm. that gives an appearance of conflict. So a lot of the fellows ask the judges very personal questions. What made you go into this? What are, the, what are the difficulties that you have in balancing your life? Would you do it again, or would you go back to private practice? So they ask a lot of probing so questions. I hear positive change that can happen. Have there been any attorneys that have said, you know what, I don't think I want to do this anymore? Have there been any negative changes or fallout? I haven't heard of any because my best marketers are the prior fellows because I tell them, okay, the applications are out. Look for people. And when people submit applications, they say, how did you hear about it? Oh, so-and-so said this is a good program. And, mm -hmm. and they'll come in and say, oh, we talked to so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so. So I got four names for you. Pick at least one or two from the names that I talked to. So mm -hmm. it's the fellows themselves that recruit mm -hmm. and good. tell people about the program. It's a door opener in terms of, uh, you know, your career, for sure, because mm -hmm. you're meeting people you wouldn't mm -hmm. meet. You're developing a relationship even with people you would never have that opportunity <clears throat> but there's another, there's another part of it I, I find interesting. It's the, the weighing of career options. Because, you know, you go to law school, they don't really help you shape a career. You have to do that yourself. And sometimes, you know, things happen. You, you're, you're cast on a, an ocean of, of, of possibilities, and you can't choose. Mm -hmm. And you really need a sort of a big brother, big sister person. You can bounce this stuff or see your options and decide which one you want to pick. Because... You know, working in the, in, the, uh, in the library all your life and drafting documents all your life may not be appealing. And in, in this day of having second and third careers, mm -hmm. uh, a lawyer really has to think about how he, would, how he would advance down the career path and whether he's going to be practicing in the library or doing something else. And so I, I have noticed and I've appreciated that in this program, the options are always on the table. I could be a judge. I could run for the legislature. You could I can go work corporate, hmm? in-house counsel. In-house counsel. 
There's a lot of things other than the library. I mean, mm. Working in the carols, you know, re researching cases. And all. Um, so, uh, you know, this is an eye-opener because the truth is that when you're in that job, mm. you don't think much about what's outside that job. So this is an opportunity to meet people who are outside the normal silo, outside it, who right. can give you information about alternative ways of practicing, alternative ways to lead your life, actually. You know, and then I've had heard that some of the fellows keep in touch with some of the panelists that they meet. Yeah. And so on a yearly basis, they, they touch base. Because when you're in a large law firm, you don't really talk to the managing partner about your personal life or something. If you're in a crisis, you're having a family situation. You wouldn't. You wouldn't. you wouldn't because it would you're, jeopardize your yes. chances of going up the ladder. But you have, you have had a relationship with someone outside your office in which you can confide in and which mm -hmm. you can ask for, should I stay in the practice of law or should I start looking at? And I think one of the best panelists is John Komeji. He said, you know, I was happy of being a litigator. I love being in the courtroom. But these things came my way, and I said, wow, maybe I should take a chance. I should, even after 35 years of practicing, I should take a chance and go outside the box and see where it takes me. And to the fellows, to hear this kind of, wow, yeah, we, we should, because attorneys are generally we're adverse to risk, True. very adverse to risk. So then it's to teach people there's other things, and if this is not your cup of tea, you don't like it, you can step outside. And there's nothing wrong with stepping outside. Because we're not all traditionalists in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you get to think about things. And there's a lot, in my view, there's a lot to think about these days. Um, it goes back to something that I've said in this program, and that is, uh, you know, inherent in our legal training is the notion that we are the guardians of the rule of law. And most of us haven't thought too much about that because the system has worked pretty well. It's mm -hmm. predictable. Uh, that's, the, that's the nature of the rule of law. It's predictable, mm -hmm. right? Okay. We have it until now. That. Until now. Yeah. And so <clears throat> if there is one group of people in the community, in our horizontal, vertical community in this country, who are responsible, really responsible, for protecting the rule of law, who is it? It's not the butchers and bakers and candlestick makers. It's the lawyers. Mm -hmm. They're trained for this, and they should be thinking about it. So this program is a way maybe to inculcate or re-inculcate that thought with them, yeah. Yeah. And, and then the ethics you mentioned, you know, and, and the civility, and all these are valuable things that maybe you don't always learn in law school, and you don't always learn in practice. And somebody says to you, wait, let's just think for a minute about how you can serve the profession how you can serve the community. Yeah. yeah, as Judge Dan Foley, retired Judge Foley, mm -hmm. he talks about his life as a private attorney and his pro bono experiences to have saved people in prison who've taken on cases from Micronesians, taking on the same-sex marriage case and all these things in private practice. And he said he did it all pro bono, free. He didn't charge because he believed in it. So to hear that kind of story from a person who walked in their shoes, who did it, was able to make a living, but able to make a real dent in a problem in society is very, very inspiring. Yes, it is. We're going to leave it there, Pat. Hey. It's a beautiful program. I, I envy you, um, you know, having the psychic benefit of being around it and developing it and creating new, new elements and components for it. It's really been wonderful for 10 years, 11 almost. And uh, thank you for coming down. And, thank and you. Keeps us, us young. Understand. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you, too. you Keisha. Okay. Why don't you say goodbye to the people, Keisha? Goodbye, people. <laughs> <laughs> you've been watching Life in the Law, and you've been here with Ms. Pat Mal Shimitsu. Shimizu. Shimizu. And of course, Jay Fidel. I'm Keisha King. We'll see you next time. Aloha.